I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. Today, we will be talking about the Blessed Virgin Mary's impact on the apostles and on the lives of priests today. We'll also look at devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and her importance in Christian revelation, especially at the wedding feast of Cana. So if you have any questions related to today's topic, we urge you to send us an email and uh, writing to scripture and tradition at EWTN.com and we'll try to get to it, okay? So we are continuing on in chapter 9 of my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. And, of course, the book is still available at EWTN's Religious Catalog, which is EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 81098, 81098. And I believe we're starting on page 233. Last week, I started talking about the three episodes in the New Testament that uh, where Mary in, you know, has interaction with the apostles and one from the sacred tradition, namely her assumption. So it would be the episodes where uh, Our Lady is at Cana, at the cross, right in the upper room after uh, the ascension, and then her own assumption. Those are the four uh, events that involve the apostles. And it's something that we want to take a look at in order to get some spiritual insight in regard to the various kinds of suffering and pain that the people in the church have experienced because of the priest abuse scandal of, you know, a couple decades ago. And sometimes these things still come up. So we want every Catholic to be able to apply these events to their own experience, to be sure. But we also want to focus first on the victims and their families. That's the most important. And we also want to help deal with how this can affect priests who've been falsely accused, also, the uh, bishops and priests and seminarians who, because they're part of the, the group of Catholic clergy, they sometimes get a, a certain kind of corporate guilt. They'll, they didn't do anything. They're just, just part of it. Um, and we want to help stimulate this understanding of the Blessed Mother so that we can all gain in wisdom and healing as we, you know, trying to work through this crisis and come out the other side of it with a, a strong sense of healing and strength as we want to see things work for the good. So the first of these episodes that I'd like to take a look at is the wedding feast at Cana. Uh, this is the first experience where, where Mary interacts and has an influence on the apostles. Uh, at one point in this wedding, the people were running out of wine, and Jesus' mother, doesn't give her name, it just says the mother of Jesus, went to him and said they have no wine. His response was to say, what to me and to you? That's, and that's idiomatic. Uh, oftentimes it's translated as uh, how does this affect me and you, things like that. But it's an idiomatic phrase you see in the Old Testament in Hebrew, what to me and to you. Um, and uh, the key issue is this. As he says, what to me and to you, woman, um, my hour has not yet come. When he talks about the hour, this is something that is mentioned a number of times in the Gospel of St. John. 
And when he talks about his hour, it's always his hour of suffering and death. So he's saying that this hour has not yet come. However, our Lord is well aware that working a miracle will set in motion, this will act as a trigger to set in motion the process that moves him towards that hour. And she doesn't claim to understand what's happening with the hour. She doesn't know. And she doesn't try to answer that question. She simply tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. It's interesting that in the gospel, especially we see this in the two luminous mysteries at the wedding feast and the uh, transfiguration, that both Jesus' mother, our lady, and his heavenly father tell the apostles, do whatever he tells you. This is the command. Good thing to follow in principle. So at that point, Jesus gives instructions to fill six stone water jars. Stone was used uh, because if it touches something unclean, it can be reused. If you have a clay jar and it touches something unclean, you have to break it and throw it away. But if it's a stone jar, you can clean it and then reuse it. And this water was especially set aside for purification. People would wash their hands and pour it out to wash their feet. You know, so uh, this otherwise would be unclean. Um, this would not be the, the first, uh, you know, container of water you'd go to to get your wine. But that's, that's what our Lord tells them to do. And, uh, and then take it and go to the chief priest. Um, this is uh, what they say. Well, in verses 4 through 10, uh, we, we see that uh, they do so. They, they, uh, after he says, my hour has not yet come, and his mother said, do whatever he tells you. Uh, they have the six stone jars there uh, for Jewish purification. Jesus explained to them, fill it. They filled it uh, up to the brim. He said, now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. And when the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then pour wine you have kept the good wine until now. And this is, you know, this first miracle. But St. John doesn't use the word miracle in his gospel. He calls these signs. And the signs are always pointing beyond themselves. And that's true here, too. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as it says in John chapter 2, verse 11, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This is a, a very important element that because of the Blessed Mother's intercession, where she asks Jesus, uh, it would just point, she doesn't even ask him what to do. She doesn't tell him how to fix the situation. She simply, with great sensitivity, points out a problem that would embarrass the hosts, the running out of wine and just do whatever he says. She, it's very important that she doesn't try to tell him how to do it. And in this way, uh, we can take a look at the encyclical. I mentioned this last week. Um, there is that chapter eight 
of Lumen Gentium in the Vatican II documents. And that whole chapter 8 is about the Blessed Mother. Well, St. John Paul wrote an encyclical because he was well aware how especially in the West, not in his native Poland, they never had a difficulty with devotion to Our Lady. But in the West, there was a great neglect of devotion to the Blessed Mother. So he wrote an encyclical, Redemptoris Mater. And I'd like to take a look at paragraph 21, where he wrote, another essential element of Mary's maternal task is found in her words to the servants, do whatever he tells you. The Mother of Christ presents herself as the spokeswoman of her son's will, pointing out those things which must be done so that the salvific power of the Messiah can be manifested. That is his saving power. At Cana, thanks to the intercession of Mary and the obedience of the servants, Jesus begins his hour. At Cana, Mary appears as believing in Jesus. Her faith evokes his first sign and helps to kindle the faith of the disciples. This is a very important part that they needed to have their own faith. They, they somehow were attracted to Jesus some of his disciples were told to follow Jesus by John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Follow him. And they do. But their faith wasn't so sure now that they, they come to that point. And this is you know, her maternal task. She's already asked acting like a mother by letting her faith lead to evoking faith from the disciples. And this is uh, something that's very important. Now, keep in mind, the apostles apparently started to have faith in Jesus at Cana. But it doesn't mean that their faith was then, oh boy, I believe it's just all set. No. Our Lord had to rebuke them. We went through that when we went through the first chapter of this whole book. How many times our Lord had rebuked them, O oh, you of little faith, speaking to the same apostles that had faith at Cana, but at other points, they don't have faith, like in the storm on the sea, when Peter's walking on the water, and when they ran out of bread, uh, he has to rebuke them. But this was the spark. Our Lady's request was a spark that ignited their faith in its first steps and began them on the process of entering ever more deeply into faith in Jesus. Now, this is something very important because after the Vatican Council, there were a lot of people uh, in the church, we talked about this, clergymen, religion professors at seminaries, the lay faithful, all had various kinds of a lack of faith. People would slip back. Um, there was, on one hand, there was a lack of faith that the church had something to say to the modern world. And many times, folks inside the church including seminary professors, would look to psychology and to sociology and use that as the touchstone of truth, that the church has to figure in with all that. Also, after, you know, again, when I grew up in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of people had a challenge to the faith, a loss of faith because of the Nazi atrocities in Europe and then the tr atrocities done by the Imperial Army of Japan in the Pacific. 
people experience, you know, how can people do this? And it was a shocking time. And just looking at that, uh, you know, reality was hard. Uh, and then, of course, that we dropped an atomic bomb, two atomic bombs, and the reality of what that meant. I remember being told that we, when they were showing something about the atom bomb, we were told, and then people on the television station said, send your children out of the room or have them close their eyes. I peeked, you know, I would look at it. Uh, but this was the, 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 the difficulty of faith. We also had various philosophies coming up after great hopes for a wonderful society based on science and psychology and technology. We had the reality of the world war where more people were killed than in any previous war. And this led existentialist philosophers to question what is the purpose of life? It's, life is meaningless. After they had their high hopes for a perfect society, they saw it dashed and they lost meaning. Scientists themselves were reducing reality to mathematical formulae. They would look at models and mathematics and, and measurements, and they would not be able to see that there was any purpose in science. They just absolutely rejected that science, uh, that the physical things have a meaning or a purpose. Uh, that was a big part. And that meant that the cosmos, a word that you know, means the universe, but the cosmos, which in Greek means beautiful, they said wasn't beautiful. And it wasn't special. It's just that. Eh, you know, it's no big deal. And it didn't have purpose. And it all came into existence by various accidents of natural history. There, God didn't direct it in any way. And then human beings uh, either have no free will at all. That was, there was one school called determinism. People are just doing what they do because they're determined by their environment to do what they do. And that was the determinist school popular in uh, parts of psychology, such as by B.F. Skinner and his disciples. Others went to the other extreme, like the existentialist, and said, no, there's no meaning in life except to make a decision and not to decide is to decide. But all you've got is your free will and nothing else has meaning except to make a decision. But as one of the uh, existentialists had said all through his career, he had a terrible struggle not to commit suicide. He, his own philosophy was so meaningless he could barely avoid committing suicide because he had no purpose in life. And this came into the, the seminaries, uh, Catholic, first the Protestant and then Catholic, through people like Rudolf Bultmann, who was a disciple, or he was friends and a disciple of the existentialist philosopher Martin Heidegger. And he just saw that the, the meaning of man is that man is a being who's moving toward death. And that until you face death, you have nothing. And so he said, we Christians have to get rid of belief in the resurrection of Jesus because it's a way to avoid death. Well, not really. You still have to die. It's just that there's a resurrection after death. We said, no, 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 we, we, don't, we can't believe in the resurrection and be good existentialists. So he'd rather be a good existentialist than a good Lutheran. And his interpretation, he was the number one uh, most important interpreter of the New Testament in the middle of the 20th century. And you know he uh, had tremendous impact first on Protestant seminaries, but on the professors of many Catholic seminaries who had gone to graduate schools where his ideas were taught. And people denied the miracles. And I can remember back in the day that there were people saying, well, Bible scholars say that there probably wasn't a real resurrection, but the people just felt the presence of Jesus. You mean they were 
executed and tortured because they just sort of felt his present while they're saying that they saw him rise from the dead? You know, that didn't even make sense. Um, but they taught it anyway. Sometimes people get educated beyond their intelligence. Well, look, we'll take a little break. We'll see some of the other impacts of the lack of faith that occurred in the church and how we have to take a look at the antidote to that lack of faith. So we'll be back in just a minute, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We're discussing how there was a, a, a serious problem in the culture of losing faith, especially in the post-war period. And it was a problem that also entered into the Catholic world. Certainly uh, the mainline Protestant uh, communities as well as the Catholic community and, and others uh, as well in the universities and such. This was fairly, fairly common. Um, it, and that lack of faith had ramifications beyond just not accepting the doctrines of the church. There was another element. And there was, namely, there was a lack of accepting of the moral norms. Now, there were a, a variety of challenges to our morality. Um, one of the key things that happened was back in the 1940s, uh, Alfred Kinsey did two studies. One was on male sexuality, the other on female sexuality. Uh, these were the first studies done on this topic that really hit popular impact. There have been, of course, some studies before that. Uh, but, you know, Alfred Kinsey did this report and published it, and it was a, a, a big seller. It was one of the, you know, top sellers in uh, New York Times and all that. And one of the keys for him is that he reduced the human sexual urge to an animal instinct. These are the, the same urges that any animal is. He was an entomologist. He studied uh, insects. And his dissertation was on the uh, lifespan and I think the genetics and the quick development of a certain moth. Uh, that lives three days, so he could do multiple generations to study it. And uh, Kinsey treated human beings like the moths, and that their sexuality had no more meaning than that. So he would ask questions of all these people. And there were a number of very important things. He, he saw that all sexual acts were simply part of nature and had had no meaning to it. So some of the ideas that you see with uh, some of the other sciences, that there's no purpose, no meaning, no beauty, none of that uh, can be read into it. It's just you know, something that's part of nature. And uh, he therefore concluded that human sexuality should not be regulated by religious codes and by civil laws. He wanted to have that change. And in fact, he and some of his staff would go to state legislatures to get them to decriminalize many sexual acts. 
Uh, you know, so and you know, these laws had been, you know, ways to keep people a little bit more under uh, some self-control. Uh, I know, for instance, when I was growing up in Illinois, if you even drove a young woman across the state line, that was considered statutory rape. And if you did uh, get a girl pregnant, you were criminally responsible for that. And they would do, they didn't have DNA tests, but they would do blood tests and see if you were the father and you would be, uh, you can go to jail uh, for, for this uh, if they're under uh, age and such. And he wanted to get rid of all those moral laws and codes. And it's back in the 40s he started this and continued it on. And he also, his uh, students and members of his department also were uh, very influential in SICUS, the Sex Information and Education Committee of the United States. In other words, they were the ones who were writing the sex ed books for the public schools. And this idea that there's no moral or legal limitations is there. What's really twisted, and the reason I mention this so much, is that in his study, somebody unnamed had a sexually abused about 500 boys aged two months to 14 years, and then reported the abuse and the sexual reactions of the boys. And, his, and Kinsey's conclusion was, it was, even though the boys were crying, fainting, becoming hysterical, and begging for it to stop, he said this was still good for the boys to be introduced to sexual uh, experience by an adult. My question when I read that was, um, where exactly was the FBI with a uh, battering ram and a whole sheaf of arrest warrants to find out, get the records and find out who did this to these boys? But they never did. They never did. And then when you see that he re recommends this, of course there was going to be sexual misbehavior if somebody as important as this, the guy that they're consulting for the sex ed books, is saying that it's good for kids to be introduced to sexuality. This isn't good. And uh, in fact, it was part of the mischief. Now, any adult who followed that advice is still culpable for breaking the law and for breaking the moral code against abuse of young people. There's no doubt. But you can also see where this was justified. You had even theologians inside the Catholic Church at, you know, in the late 60s also challenging and rejecting Pope Pius VI, excuse me, Pope Paul VI uh, teaching on humane vitae against artificial birth control. And that meant that there was a separation between sex and its role for procreation as well as its uh, uh, role for uh, unity with a spouse. And the Pope had warned that if you make that separation through birth control, you uh, will open up the door, not only for a, a birth control, but for abortion, that happened, and infidelity in marriage, fornication outside of marriage, and a widespread homosexuality. Read Humana Vita. Go to our EW10 document library at EW10.com, and you'll see exactly what, uh, read the document, especially just the last paragraphs you see that it was a prophetic document. So this is a widespread modern doubt about God, about Jesus Christ, his resurrection, his meaning for life, 
and also basic morality. Uh, and present day disciples need to return to Cana as much as the first disciples did. They need to learn from the faith of the Blessed Mother that they can have faith in her son and do so in the service of the needs of others. That's why she said something to him. It was for the needs of others. She wasn't going to get anything out of it. It was to help those in need. They didn't, they had no wine. Well, we also want to return to morality for the sake of other people and their real needs. She shared her faith in Jesus, her son, with the servants by telling them to do whatever he told him. We have to follow Jesus and do what he tells us. And that miracle that followed inspired the apostles to believe. Modern disciples, including uh, bishops and priests and deacons, truly need deepening devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary so that she can inspire inside of them more faith in the service of the people that need them not to go to ministry for any kind of selfishness, which I don't think most people do, but you can slip into a selfish use of the ministry if you're not careful and you don't keep your faith focused on Jesus to do whatever he said. And the, this is a great providence that in this century, the, toward the beginning of this century, Pope St. John Paul included the wedding feast of Cana, among the luminous mysteries, the mystery of light. This will, is meant to help us grow in faith so that we can take a look at the dirty waters of modern lack of faith, modern immorality, the breakdown of family, the abuse of other people, increase of rape and other uh, crimes uh, and morality, and let Jesus Christ transform us so that we have the best wine of a Christian culture that highlights life and brings joy. This is a culture built on the kind of faith that does whatever Jesus tells us to do and to do so with God's purpose in mind so that we use science. Science is great. Technology is great art, recreation, education, and all other aspects of modernity for the sake of growing closer to God and having faith in Him and receiving the salvation He offers us. This is what we're looking for. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. And next week, we'll take a look at the role of the beloved disciple with Our Lady at the cross and her influence there. So we'll take that up next week. Let's take a look at some of your emails. Uh, first of all, we have an email from Susan in Ohio. Dear Father Mitch, why is it that the recital of formal prayers is sometimes split up between the leader or celebrant and the people? For example, with the Our Father, the priest recites the first half and the congregation recites the second half. Same with the uh, Hail Mary and the Creed during the Rosary or in praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet, Susan, Ohio. Well, Susan, let me um, uh, uh, go back on a number of my own experiences. When you have everybody doing the whole prayer together, there's always somebody who sort of lags behind the others. They, for various reasons, they speak a little more slowly or something. And what happens when you share it, you split it, it gives people a chance to build up a, a rhythmic praying together so that the whole group can pray together without somebody starting to fall behind because they might have forgotten a, a, a certain word or phrase or something like that. And then everybody from the first group can catch up again. It's a way to give everybody a breather 
as you do half the prayer and then the next you do the other half. This goes back to ancient Israel. They would do uh, the Psalms that way. They would do, uh, somebody would do one part of the Psalm, then the congregation would respond. Uh, that's just one of the ways that uh, helps human beings to pray together, pray the same thing together, and give them each enough breathing room in order to uh, do so without losing their breath or losing their place. And it works out very, very nicely as a result. We have a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And what can we do for you this fine day? Well, uh, the subject that you're talking about, about uh, the Blessed Mother's uh, influence on the apostles and to, uh, and to today, to our priests, I'm actually part of a Seven Sisters apostolate um, at our church in um, St. Joseph's Old Cathedral in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. where we have seven women each praying a holy hour for our, our pastor and our associate pastor uh, seven days a week, covering them in prayer. Well, nice. And primarily it's to um, bring our Blessed Mother, you know, into our prayer, to pray with our priests, grow in devotion to our Blessed Mother, and to acknowledge the fact that as she formed Jesus, we ask her to form our priest uh, every day. Yeah. Well, I, I like that. Thank you all for doing that. <coughs> we priests certainly need that. And I'll never forget a Protestant lady who had written a book uh, years ago, uh, her name, last name was Sanford, and I, I can't remember the book now, but uh, it's been over 50 years since I read it. But uh, in the, the, the book, she talked about how she and some of her lady friends would go to their church, I think it was an Episcopal church, and they would get there before everybody else, as soon as the church opened, and start praying for everybody. Pray for the place, pray for the choir, the acolytes, and the minister. And then each one of them would pick one person in the congregation to pray for. And they would look for the crankiest, most miserable looking person in the parish. And they would pray for that person through, through the service. And they said that, you know, as time went on, the effect of their prayer really had a tremendous effect on everybody around them. The, prayer, the parishes came very, very much strongly alive. Well, we need it. That's why we have Eucharistic adoration, but also to have this kind of group where, uh, I know, again, the Diocese of Orange County, California, uh, when Bishop, uh, I think it was Bishop Brown, I forget the name of the bishop now, but he was the bishop there, uh, and he assigned every parish one day a month to pray for the priests. And they all, they would have a holy hour for all the priests of the diocese at that one parish. And the next day, another parish. So they got all around this stuff. Um, that's a, it's, you cannot underestimate this. And seeking the intercession of Our Lady for the priest, this is a very good thing to do. So thank you for doing that and letting us know. Maybe more people will pick up the same idea. We'll take a little break. We'll come back in a couple of minutes with more of your questions, so please stay with us. Welcome back. First, I'd like to invite you to join me on Wednesday night, tomorrow night, uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We will be visiting with Catholic psychologist and good friend, Dr. Ray Garendi, who will try to provide some answers to issues such as, why do so many parent, parents feel that raising children in the faith is a losing battle. How do you resolve the tension 
when one spouse is more religious than the other? And what should I do when my adult children aren't living the faith? And we'll have a little fun with it as we go, because he's a wise guy, and so am I. So we match. <laughs> It'll be fun. All right, let's get uh, here an email. Uh, this one is from Rachel in Connecticut. Hi, Father Mitch. I'm a new convert and often have to look up the difference between venial versus mortal sin, and I'm still confused. What uh, would you be able to di differentiate them for me? Also, how does one prepare for proper confession for each? Uh, Rachel, um, you know, the, the key thing, first of all, remember this, Rachel, that the distinction between venial sin and mortal sin is a distinction that is made in the first epistle of St. John, chapter 5. And he, he says, if you see your brother sinning, pray for him. Now, if the sin is mortal, I don't say pray for him. But if the sin is not mortal, he didn't use the word venial. He just used the word not mortal. Uh, and he uh, then uh, if it's not mortal, then pray for him. But if it is mortal, I don't say to pray for that. Why, why not? Because with mortal sin, you need to go to confession before you can re-enter the sacraments. Now, given that this distinction is made in the scriptures, we have to understand it. What was St. John talking about? Well, there are differences in the effects of sin. Some sins are certainly more serious than others uh, for a variety of reasons. For instance, st murder is much more serious than getting into a barroom brawl. You can recover from a barroom brawl, but when you kill somebody, you've taken a life that is not yours to take. So that has much more weight, both because it's the whole of a person's life, as well as it being something that you can't undo. And it's contrary to the fifth commandment, very directly, in a very serious way. And that's what makes it, it, it we call it grave matter. Grave in Latin means heavy. So this is grave or serious matter. And there's some actions, for instance, stealing. If somebody steals a pack of gum from a large store like Walmart or something, that's a sin. But it does not have the same impact as if you stole $5 from some guy who's living on the streets. The $5 of the guy living on the street might be all he has for food for that day. Whereas the package of gum in the uh, store uh, isn't their whole, it's bad and it's a terrible thing to do. There's no justification for stealing anything from anybody. But, you know, you, uh, it's not as serious an effect on a very large grocery store to lose a package of gum as it is for somebody living on the street to live, lose $5. So you have to weigh the serious impact of the sin. Uh, most of the time we would say, you know, grand larceny would be uh, a mortal sin. Now, even though in California they could treat it like a misdemeanor to steal up to $950, $950 worth of merchandise in a store is very serious for the store owner, especially if a lot of people do so. Even though the state said it's okay, it's not okay. It's not. 
we have to go by God's law saying thou shalt not steal anything. But the seriousness of that act of stealing depends on how that has an effect on the person from whom you steal. Um, other sins are in and of themselves mortal. So, for instance, blaspheming God, rejecting God, denying his existence. Uh, the, these are sins in themselves. And uh, acts, you know, the, the sexual acts, especially when you are, uh, say, committing the uh, adultery, where you are intruding upon somebody's marriage, that's a really serious sin. And I know that People's Magazine may not think so, but it is, not by their standards, but by God's. And so those serious sins have to, to be brought to confession. And what you have to do is take a look at your motive and how you got there and ask God's forgiveness and bring it to confession. That would be the thing. And you can go online and find a number of good examinations of conscience, and that'll help you prepare for confession. All right, we have another email. This one is from John in Lansing, Michigan. Dear Father Mitch, was the Virgin Mary considered to be unwed to Joseph at the time of the Annunciation, when the angel appeared to her, Matthew 1, 19, says, uh, says Joseph decided to divorce her quietly, which appears to indicate Joseph was her husband at the time, John and Lansing. We have to take uh, the idea of marital betrothal very differently than we look at it. If you are betrothed, you had to get a divorce to get out of the betrothal. This was, uh, and it would have been considered adultery, not fornication. Now, they were not formally married and living together, but the betrothal gave a commitment in the relationship that was as serious as marriage. And you no longer looked at anybody else and you couldn't, certainly couldn't relate to anybody uh, else sexually. That would be totally unacceptable. And it could be a death penalty if, if uh, you know, it's shown that you did have relations with somebody who is not your betrothed, that could lead to a death penalty. St. Joseph was saving her from that. Uh, that was his idea, but then the angel explained what was going on, so he went ahead and married her in the full, fullest extent. But betrothal was so serious, it was considered already married, um, and it's not like we would consider somebody unmarried in the modern world. And then we have an email from Kevin all the way down in the wonderful continent of Australia. Beautiful place if you ever get to go. Father Mitch, I was at a Catholic study group, uh, a group study recently, and one of the participants stated that there was more than four Gospels. They were referring to the supposed Gospel of Thomas. Was the early church aware of this Gospel at the time the canon of Scripture was formulated? And what is the status of this Gospel as compared to the writings of the church fathers? Kevin in Australia. Kevin, they not only was the church well aware of the Gospel of Thomas, but they were aware of a lot of other Gospels. All the different epistles, acts, and Gospels that existed in the early church numbered about 150 outside the New Testament. And they were well aware of it. If you, uh, if you would like, you can go to a book written by St. Irenaeus. St. Irenaeus wrote a book around 180, 185 A.D. He was the uh, bishop 
of Lugdunum, which we now today call by its French name, Lyon. He was the bishop there. It was a port city, a river port. It was, it was upriver, but a serious port city uh, for Gaul. And he wrote a book called Against the Heresies, Contra Heresies. And especially in the first three books of that work, he lays out many of these different gospels and the groups that wrote them. What he knew and what scholars know today and what the early church knew is that these books were written at the earliest 150 A.D., almost a, a hundred years, anywhere from a uh, uh, hundred to 75 years after the apostles had already died. And Thomas was long uh, martyred by that point. And so they knew that they were very late. And when you read them, I've read the Gospel of Thomas and some of the, a number of these other Gospels, you can tell whoever wrote this was not a Jew. He was not someone who was familiar with Jewish life in the Roman uh, province of Palestine in the first century at all. It, he writes, that, or all of them wrote like people who lived in Egypt in the Hellenistic period. They're more influenced by Greek philosophy as it was taught in Alexandria, Egypt, than anything that would have happened at the time of Christ. So they were well aware of these books. They knew they were very late, and the church rejected them because they were not written by the apostles who they claimed to have been written by. They were spurious and rejected for that reason. Plus, that when you read them, they're kind of dumb. But that's another issue. All right, we're out of time. The Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by his peace. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and grant you a wonderful, wonderful time with your family and great peace together. And also, we ask that you keep us generously in your own concerns so that we can do these shows. Uh, we can't bring them to you without your help. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your turkey bill, and all the other food bills. And that way, we'll be able to pay all of our bills, too. God bless you all, and thank you.